Welcome to Midlife Matters. I'm Marie, and each week I'm joined by my friends Julie and Mindy to talk about all the topics keeping women in the middle years up at night. Finding meaningful work that impacts others is one of the keys to happiness. Today we're talking about how we can use our gifts and talents to make a difference in the world. Join us as we talk about discovering your genius zone, that place where you love what you're doing so much that you lose track of time. Listeners, today we're discussing Chapter 5 in our Happy School book by Julie Gordon. And if you're new to this series, you do not need to be reading the book to follow along. We're doing one episode a month, and today we're up to Chapter 5, which discusses using our gifts and talents to meet a need in the world. And each chapter in this book is leading us to the subtitle of the book, which is Where Women Learn the Secrets to Overcome Discouragement and Worry. So no worries if you're just joining in, because we're making sure that each episode and chapter can stand alone. And I'm excited to talk about this chapter because I think in midlife, looking at where our gifts and talents are and how we can make a difference in the world is very applicable. Like we're going through new stages, we're reaching new phases, and women do tend to step back and say, okay, what's for my, and this is kind of a new term that I hadn't heard into a few years ago, but what's going to be my second act? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Are you guys familiar with that term? Well, from the movie. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the Jennifer Lopez movie. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. And I remember it. They talked about it on the middle where she stops being a car salesman and moves to dental hygienist. It's kind of like what you did in the first part of your life doesn't have to be what you do in the second part of your life. And then I've even heard people use the term third act, like after you retire. Right. Yeah. Well, it seems to be a common theme and it's definitely relatable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if you spent your life, in the home, raising children, being a homemaker, you actually, I mean, you can't keep doing that. <laughs> you have <laughs> to have not, a second act. I right? mean, you you have you, to have a, a plan B and, you know, nobody likes a career change at 55 or whatever. So that, that makes it hard. You just want to keep adopting or like Marie, you <laughs> no, go out and I don't. get a dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go out and get a dog. <laughs> yes. Well, before we dive in, listeners, there are a few ideas which we will briefly review so that if you haven't read previous chapters, you'll know what we're talking about. So she has some principles in the book. And the first one is that our thinking determines our emotions. And so often we think our emotions determine our thinking. Mm -hmm. Basically, how we think about something determines how we feel about it. And we have the ability to interrupt our thoughts and intentionally think about something else by moving into another room. And this is a principle that you'll hear us talk about. You can play hot potato with your thoughts or you can move into another room where you're thinking about a negative thing, but you Mm -hmm. can move into a more positive line of thinking. And then the third one, the third principle is that we learn to quarantine our negative thoughts as well as reframe refute and replace them. So this book is a lot about identifying negative thinking, which she calls what's missing and disappointing. And then how are we going to reframe that? And how are we going to refute it? And then how are we going to replace it? So those are kind of the three main things that we have been working on in this book up until now. And in lesson five, we're going to focus on discovering and pinpointing our one of a kind genius zone. And this name just makes you want to do it. I mean, I want to know what my one-of-a-kind genius zone is. <laughs> and this is where we create a life of being useful with our gifts. It's where we learn to use our skills and interests to meet a need in the world. And this is how we really flourish. Not only is it our duty to be beneficial to our fellow human mm-hmm. beings with our gifts, but it is a secret to happiness. So I've just said a lot of words, but basically we are going to be finding out, and this is what we worked on for the last month, what are we good at and how can we put it to use in the world? Mm -hmm. And that sounds like a simple concept, but it's actually a lot more deep. Don't you agree, Mindy and Julie? It is, and it can strike fear, um, maybe in some people like it did me, Mm -hmm. whereas I wasn't (laughs) as excited as Marie. I thought my first thought was, What if you don't have a genius zone? (laughs) What if you're the only person that doesn't have a genius zone? (laughs) I don't think I have one. (laughs) Yeah, it stressed me out a little bit. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Well, and genius is a hard word to live up to. Like, 
you know, maybe we could call it something else. If maybe the word genius inter- intimidates people because it's like, right. I don't think I'm that exceptional. Right. But believe me, there's something about you that you're good at that you can meet a need. Oh, thanks, Marie. No. <laughs> could think of is just being in the zone you know what i mean yes, like working that's... where everything i think julie gordon said like where all the rockets are firing you know what i mean like mm-hmm. right, right right and this is something you really have to look internally you cannot find this by looking at somebody else at all mm-hmm. no mm-hmm. well why do we even need to find our genius zone why do we even need to be working on something julie because I mean, at this point, can't we put our feet up and just have ease and constant pleasure? <laughs> Obviously, I'm speaking facetiously, but there is that myth that ease and constant pleasure are the secrets to our happiness. And do you guys believe that or not? If you don't believe it, why? Well, I think as Americans, it is easy to believe this. It's kind of built into the American dream. Like if you work hard, you finally reach a point of ease and leisure. and you can even see that like in the living for the weekend mentality. It's like, I'm going to put in these five days and then it's my time, you know? Mm -hmm. And I don't know that I would have said I believed that necessarily, but I think I've lived that way, you know? Mm. Um, Like even in the Christian world, like if life is good, then you're doing everything right. Or if things are going badly, you want to get it back to normal. Like ease and comfort is the normal. Mm-hmm. We've normalized that, you know, mm-hmm. uh, like like it's the way it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Right. I definitely related with this so much. I underlined so many of the different things that were in the book um, that talked about this. I definitely see it as an immature way of thinking because I can see growth in even my own life over time that as a child, I thought that was the pursuit. And then mm-hmm. I wondered why what was wrong with me or I, you know, I wasn't happy all the time. My circumstances were not happy all the time. And it was really (laughs) a Mm -hmm. hard wake up call to, um, to, to learn how to be happy when the circumstances weren't so happy. Mm -hmm. But this is also, um, this chapter was so fitting in multiple conversations with, um, my children in general, but one son in particular who struggled with being upset or angry whenever Mm -hmm. he played the Xbox. And Mm. this might be hard to relate to, or you might be a mom out there struggling with this too. But um, it was something that the conversation was, this is something you're choosing to do with your free time and it's not making you happy. And so um, we ended up taking the Xbox away and seeing this child now he's he's filled that time that space you know after having conversations of being more purposeful with his free time he's been a much more joyful happy child by actually practicing for the ACT keeping his room cleaner mm. holding him to a higher standard with his bathroom and that goes against all Mm -hmm. efforts, you know, like that, that goes against your thinking that you think I have free time. I'm going to do something fun. Mm -hmm. Yet it was making him angry. Mm. And by, by asking even my own child to, to, you know, to more, to asking him to meet a higher standard, he's getting more creative in Mm -hmm. his, in his, in essence, free time. And he is so much happier. Right. Yeah. I think we see in the world that this myth doesn't hold up because when you see the super rich, sometimes they are the most messed up people. And sometimes they go after the weirdest and weird and more weird things because after a while, just normal things don't even satisfy or please them anymore. And they just become more off the trail and more off the trail. And I can remember, I don't know if it was Bill Cates or somebody else, But like different rich people you'll read about in magazines where they say like, I'm not giving my wealth to my children or Mm -hmm. like, I'm not going to allow my child to inherit this or my child has to wait 15 years after they become an adult to get any of my wealth because they want to protect them from only having a life of constant ease and pleasure and money, such excess amounts of money takes away their need to have meaningful work, which is really what 
does make us happy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at lottery winners, you know, Mm -hmm. they Mm -hmm. often have tragic ends. Mm -hmm. And in our family, I don't know about you guys, but for some reason, this conversation will come up when we're all together periodically. Like, well, what what would you do if you won a million dollars or the lottery or whatever, you know? Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, or the what is it? The publisher's clearing. House. Oh, yeah. That was right. an old time um, one. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and everybody has their own what they do with it. And my family kind of laughs at me because I always said I would never want to win it because mm. I just think I've just seen too much of how it it just seems to ruin people. Like, I don't know that we were meant to just live that way and not have right. to work. I mean, God created work mm-hmm. and um, for a reason. We mm-hmm. were meant to, to work. Right. right. Well, let's talk about boredom because she says that if you're bored, it's a sign you're living below your potential and capabilities. So when I read that, I was like, oh, I don't know. But do you guys struggle with boredom? In general, I don't, but I worry that I will. Um, That's a good. I wonder how long will the things that I do be fulfilling? Because most of it comes from serving my family, Mm -hmm. and I do feel like I've been contributing and offering what I sense I was meant to give. But I'm losing that job. Mm, (laughs) You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm being phased out. So as that changes, I'm going to have to change. And so I do. I do worry about how long. Mm-hmm. This will last. And um, when people talk about retirement, like moving away and living at the beach or doing this, that is never something that's interested me. I just don't think I would like just living this life of leisure. Like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's right. never appealed to me mm-hmm. to just be done and live live that way. I don't right. know. Mm-hmm. Right. I know. And I had to I had to separate it in my mind. So boredom is not a lack of activity because. I feel like I have been intentional with a my lack of activity. Like I have intentionally not signed on for too much so that I have time in my day to rest. And that's an active word to mm-hmm. me. So that rest could be going for a walk by myself. It could be um, just making space in my schedule. Boredom is when that intentionality runs out. You know, Mm -hmm. it's when you no longer, you're like, well, what should I do with myself? You know, there's nothing (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like I'm not feeling fulfilled um, Mm -hmm. in whatever you're doing. You could be busy and bored. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, when I when I saw your question, Julie, do you struggle with boredom? I thought I really don't struggle with boredom. Like I can always find something Mm -hmm. to amuse myself, think about project to work on, you know, something I'm interested in researching, whatever. But the second part of the question, if so, it's a sign you're living below our potential and capabilities. I was wondering if other people, and I don't know why I go always go back to other people. Mm-hmm. I know you guys don't struggle with this, but I wonder if they would say what you're doing would be so boring. So is your potential that small? Do you guys get what I'm saying? Like, like you don't have potential, like I don't have a genius like, zone? Well, no, but like <laughs> it says if you struggle with boredom, and I think sometimes mm-hmm. most people might struggle with boredom being at home. So right. they would say like your potential must be really low because if you're not struggling with boredom in that, then like are you just like one level above above a slug? Like, like this, you couldn't this be the, the CEO kind, of a corporation. Yes, like this is could... the kind of thought that pops into my head. So first of all, Marie, anybody that's ever met you would never think that because <laughs> you have made being at home a business. You have made it your work, just mm, like mm-hmm. I feel like Julie and I have as well. But And I think there was even a book out there that I remember I had some friends go through it. I, it was too self-help for me. So I never read it, but it was something about, um, making your workplace at home or, Mm, you know, or mm -hmm. anyways, that may ring a bell for somebody. Just another thought that I had about this, Julia spurred what you said, spurred it, that you can be busy and be bored because I recall Bryce saying, and, you know, many years ago, there was a job. He said, I feel like I'm dying daily. I Mm. am not using my skills. I am Mm -hmm. concerned Mm -hmm. that when I need to use my brain, it's not going to work again. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he was actively working like 65 hours a week. And so 
you can be very busy and feel that way. Yeah, I think she said being in the wrong job, not using your gifts and your potential is like pushing a cart uphill. Mm, oh, yes. mm-hmm. yeah. It feels it feels a lot heavier than it needs to. <laughs> right. And I think maybe you guys can relate to this because I did think about there definitely have been times when I've been home bored. And that was when I had little kids and mm-hmm. it was like playtime for the next three hours. <laughs> <laughs> and that's like what Bryce said, like, I'm dying a slow death. And it's not because you don't care about the kid, but it is below your potential and capability. Yeah. So it is a slow death. You read the same book a million <laughs> times. You make the same foods a million times. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The schedule doesn't change. Yeah. Playing Candyland is an example of living a oh. slow death. Poke me in the eye with a <laughs> that. Fork. I cannot deal with that game. I never... <laughs> <laughs> so I guess no matter what job you have, there's yeah. probably aspects where you are dying of boredom, but maybe that yeah, shouldn't yeah. be the all day every day. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, the author had us do an exercise where we created a list with three columns. So skills, interests, and need in the world. And this is our genius zone. And this is one of the best rooms to move into. It's a healthy escape. Now, I definitely love the concept of this. I'll just, you know, give a spoiler alert. I did not find my genius zone this month. I did write down my skills. I did write down my interests. I didn't know if I really found a need in the world that like the triangle all came together or whatever the shape would be, you know, like they didn't all intersect. In a, in a space that I felt like, oh, there's my answer. But mm-hmm. I still think the exercise is valuable. And like you said, Julie, it's kind of an ongoing exercise. And mm-hmm. so, mm-hmm. you know, maybe you'll get there. But how did you guys do with the exercise? Yeah, I was able to list a full column of interest. Mm-hmm. A little you know, less on the skills and then nil on the need. Nil? Nil? Right? Oh, <laughs> Zero, <no>. Julie? <laughs> <laughs> I got hung I got really stressed out because I got hung up a little on the needs part because I felt like, well, I can't meet any needs that are exactly humanitarian or global. You know what I mean? That, yeah, mm-hmm. need in the world might be too broad of a definition. It, yeah, it but scares on the other us. Hand, I thought <laughs> mm-hmm. about like, okay, here's an example. I totally admire people who, let's say, create lovely living spaces. Mm-hmm. that give people a place to rest and restore. So that's a need. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be global and, you know, right. this huge thing. And I, and I think that's important to remember. Like that is, that is meeting a need mm-hmm. and somebody has to do that, you know? And, mm-hmm. and she also said like, it doesn't have to be paid work. Mm-hmm. It could be volunteer work or it could even mm-hmm. just be an activity. So w- you can't just think about, you know, true going off and being the, you know, the head of a nonprofit or. (laughs) Right. Yeah. How about you, Mindy? Yeah, that's where I'm at is um, it was easy to to do the um, the interest, the skills, and then the meeting the need. It felt like it was so small. You know, the things that I thought about, um, I've mentioned before that I'm known as the greeter in my workout classes. Mm. That seems so minute, but at the same time, I know it means something to the person whose name I'm asking, you Mm -hmm. know, what Mm -hmm. is your name? And I know it means something to the person whose name I'm remembering from being there the week before, Mm. or, Mm -hmm. you know, the person that I've noticed that they have been missing. And so that was something I did actually end up writing down. I was, you know, because I have been on, um, in situations in groups before as I'm going to meet with the group, I feel so inadequate because mm-hmm. it's not a skill set that I'm actually thinking, mm-hmm. what what am I good at? Because I feel completely inadequate when it comes to what we're about to talk about. Mm-hmm. And and so I think that, um, you know, it's good to kind of do things like that sometimes. But for me, my the, the what I'm meeting in the world feels so little mm-hmm. that sometimes I question it. One easy thing for me to say is, yes, I know something about working out and being healthy. Mm-hmm. And so even if that happens one person at a time, I guess mm-hmm. that's where I'm at. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's a good good perspective yeah like we do have to bring it down to Mm -hmm. i mean that's meaningful work you know you're not getting paid but it is it is adding meaning to your life and and other people's lives around Mm -hmm. you i'm just having this flashback right now as i'm listening to you talk mindy about you know different ways that we can meet a need or or thinking back to the slow death of boredom and so many times i in my mind think that somebody that gets paid to do a job is more important than the person that doesn't get paid. So like when I had paid work, working as a speech pathologist, I can honestly say when I was doing speech therapy, I was dying a slow death. Mm -hmm. It was so boring to me. And I would look at the clock and you'd have 50 minutes with this person. And it's not that we weren't doing things together. And it's not even that I didn't see them improving But it did not, what did you say, Mindy, like fire all your cylinders? Like it did not make me feel like I was in the zone. And even though I was being paid good money and I was using my education and it was uh, somewhere where you might walk out of the room and get props because patients might be like, oh, thank you. And, you know, care, you know, family members might be like, look at you as an expert in an area. I still was dying a slow death in that therapy room. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Cuz I just it didn't it didn't um it didn't set me on fire to do that. So I guess that I'm just kind of now coming to that revelation as we're talking cuz so many times I think, well, I've got to get out there and find like an important job that people will mm. be like, "Oh, that's worth it." But sometimes the you know any job can just not be the right one for you it right. doesn't it does it doesn't hone in on your skills maybe you can do the job but it doesn't set you on fire right if it yeah. gives you energy to do it i feel like that's kind of a litmus test mm-hmm. as opposed to feeling exhausted trying to do it mm-hmm. yeah well in her study guide that leads into the next thing she did give us some prompts to kind of help us through this mhm Definitely people are going to have trouble just thinking of this on their own. So she gave some prompts. And so we're going to read what the prompts were. And then we're going to talk about maybe which ones were helpful to us. So the first prompt was, what makes you feel alive and energized? So that was kind of what I was just talking about. Mm -hmm. What things do make you feel alive and energized? And what do you do that makes you lose track of time? I love that because I isn't too. that just like the perfect job, like one where it's not yeah, even work because you've just lost track of time. <laughs> you need more time to do it. Yes. All right. What's number two, Julie? Um, what comes easy and naturally? And she said, I thought this was a good point. This is kind of what you were just saying, Marie. Just because you're good at it doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily mean you love it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's mm-hmm. an important thing to remember. Mm-hmm. All right. Number three. When did you feel most proud of yourself? And what is the core part of you that you want people to talk about at your funeral? Oh, my goodness. You guys, I hate this question. It's I like, know. I hate this question. I don't <laughs> want to think about my funeral. And what are people going to say? Like, this is like not what I want to think about. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I do like, so if we can focus in on the when you feel most proud of yourself, because I think you can think back to times like I remember when um, I learned how to lead a workout class Mm. and then I did it for long enough that I got more comfortable. Mm -hmm. And then I realized I'm energized and I'm actually so proud of myself for learning how to do this because it was a, I'll call it a later in life skill because I didn't learn it till I was like Mm -hmm. 36, 37. Um, Mm -hmm. And, and I really did, I would finish and I would just feel like I had hit, I had hit the zone. Mm-hmm. I was really proud to mm-hmm. do that. Right, right. Well, the fourth prompt is, what do others appreciate about you that makes you happy when they say it? And in what areas do people compliment you that delights you? And this is just a small thing, but, you know, so many people ask like, oh, do you make any money off your podcast? As if, again, if you're doing something that doesn't pay, you wonder why I have this complex because people ask these questions. So you automatically think any work you do that's not paid is not as important. But anyways, when we get an email or a comment or a message Mm -hmm. complimenting the podcast, I could just live off words of affirmation. Like that is my payment. Mm -hmm. Like I don't don't need money. I just like (laughs) knowing that people have listened and enjoyed it. And that's how I am about a lot of things in my life. Like if someone is noticing it and appreciating it, I can go on forever. (laughs) 
No, if it has made somebody's so life better, like when we have listeners say, this really helped me as part of my life, that's why I do it too. Mm-hmm. Like, and I was just asked that question. Um, I met a lot of people on a cruise ship this past weekend. And I was asked that quite a bit. And I always laugh when someone says, do you get paid? And I'm like, no, but honestly, that's not why we do it at all. Like Mm -hmm. none of us care about that part of it. I feel like that would actually take away some from the joy that we (laughs) each have Mm -hmm. because it would add so much more pressure to us. Mm -hmm. We can just, we have so much fun right now, like Mm -hmm. the way that it's happening Mm -hmm. now. (laughs) Yeah. 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 All right. What's number five, Julie? All right. Number five says, what drives you? What pain, injustice, or unhappiness have you witnessed that is upsetting to you? And this is where I got hung up, you know, like, well, mm. do my, does my skill set and interest alleviate any of this pain mm-hmm. and injustice? No, not necessarily. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm, I'm still struggling with that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, number six was, what qualities do you admire in other people? This meant a lot to me to think about that because it's easy to to look out than it is to look in sometimes. Mm, mm -hmm. And so I was, I was like, oh yeah, what qualities do I admire? And I could make a whole list of Mm -hmm. the things that attract me to other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She even said like, if you made a list of people you admire, maybe Mm -hmm. see, is there a pattern there? Do they, do they share similar qualities that you admire? Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. All right. This is another big one. Number seven is write down what you want to have accomplished by the end of your life and then work backwards. I hated that. <laughs> I guess I'm just in too much of a transition right now to even know what I want to have accomplished by the end of my life. Like, I That's don't know. Back to the funeral thing. Like, right. No. I have a hard time imagining what I'm going to do this <laughs> fall, let alone what I'm right. going to be doing at the end of my life. <laughs> All right, Julie, what's the last one? And the last one is take a solo retreat. And she said, sometimes you just need time alone to think about these kind of things. It could be a weekend retreat. retreat. It could just be a walk in your neighborhood, wherever you can get away. And she said, she encourages you to stick close to the double sticks of dynamite, which are prayer and the word of God. And she said, it's here that you'll, that you'll find direction. I feel like that should be on a t-shirt. The double sticks of dynamite and then <laughs> prayer and the yeah. word like it was a, a catchy way of thinking about yeah. it. Yeah, it, it is. It is. And mm-hmm. um, and I love that there's different ways to do that, that retreat. And I was like, there's no way I could leave for by, by myself for the weekend. And that doesn't even sound enjoyable. Mm-hmm. But um, but to be able to carve out time in your day or evening or whatever to 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 sit with the with prayer and with the word. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. To give yourself that space. Yeah. All right. Well, just looking at this list, Julie, what would you say was the prompt that helps you the most? Well, I like number two, like what comes easy and naturally. And, you know, I, I made a big list. That was a lot of my interest. But I also heard her say, you know, just because you're good at it doesn't mean you love it. And that was. Uh, you know, I went into pharmacy originally because I was good at math and science and it served its purpose. I worked in that field for 10 years, but I've talked, I actually talked with Julie Gordon, the author about helping me find my genius zone. And she said, Oh, I just don't, I just don't think pharmacy is it for you right now. Mm -hmm. And I've had so many people tell me that, like, you need to do, use your gifts. You need to do something creative. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that pharmacy bit a need at one mm-hmm. point, like an income. And mm-hmm. um, and it was helpful to to the world, but mm-hmm. I don't think right now that I love it enough to do mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. What was the prompt that helped you the most, Mindy? I think I'd have to go back to number one because the um, making me feel alive and energized because I could go through a list of activities that I have done in the past and I could kind of pinpoint the end result of those activities, but I have to couple that with what others appreciate about me and Mm -hmm. compliment me about, because that helps Mm -hmm. solidify whether I'm meeting a need or not in somebody Mm -hmm. else's life. Because if it's only a need for me personally, I'm not going to, I'm not going to continue it as much as I would when I feel like I'm actually making a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. And I would 
put this on me. Not Somebody else may feel this way. I needed to know I could make a difference in the world, not just in my own family, mm. but in somebody outside of my family. Mm-hmm. And because for many years, it really was in my home where is where I was needed. I had a harder time than, you know, later on, I had to find that. And I think I did that when um, I pursued being a personal trainer and teaching fitness classes. Mm-hmm. Um, it yeah. really came full circle from, from things that I had done and enjoyed as a child and the things that it wasn't easy at first, but it became easy the longer I did it. And so, um, but it's, it's something that other people um, need and have continued to talk about to me and will bring up to me and, and have yeah. questions about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've heard this question asked in a little bit different way that I think was help more helpful was just what are people continually coming to you for? Like, what are they asking of you? Okay. And that's a good mm-hmm. indicator of what, mm-hmm. you know, how yeah. your gifts could fit a need. Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, I like that. I also found um, prompt number four to probably be the most helpful or I guess the most my goal. You know, mm-hmm. like when I think about, well, what do you hope your second act is like? I hope that it makes me feel alive and energized. I hope that I lose track of time loving what I'm doing so much. And so Mm -hmm. I don't know what that is, but I definitely can tend, if if I'm not going to lose track of time and if I'm not alive and energized by something, it's really hard for me to make myself do it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And I can't get excited about that. Like, I don't think that's the goal of this book. That's definitely not the goal of her genius zone exercise. Don't necessarily run out and quit your job right now. Right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, do you have an area in your life where you've responded to a need, but it's not a calling? A need is not necessarily your calling. And the first thing that always jumps into my mind, and you guys can say it with me, nursery duty yes, or I vacation <laughs> Bible school. Those are ding, both ding, ding, needs ding. and I am dying a slow death at both of them. <laughs> Number one, baby. <laughs> and I don't believe that anybody loves it, but some people must. I mean, I know there oh, I think some be. do. I think some do. I can still smell it. Like, I, know, it I just it, can't do it. You say that and I can smell it. Like it's <laughs> Talk about the clock ticking extra slowly. Too. I know. Yes. An hour is like five hours. <laughs> yes. Yes. Are we just um. the worst women on the planet? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I always, my mom always said this, and I use, I kind of quote her here because I feel the same way. Like, um, I know a lot of women that you know want to stay home and they need to meet a need income wise. They will keep children in their home. And my mom always said, I would rather dig ditches. And I say that too. I was like, I, put me on manual labor outside digging ditches before I would do that. Oh. <laughs> At least you're free, free outside. I can right. see the sun. Well, that may be horrible, but it's so true. That's just, that is not my gifting. It's not my right. gift either. And I do have five kids. And I think some people look and say, well, you have five kids. You must love child care. No. <laughs> no. Right. No. I well, loved being at home with my kids, but that's just different. It right? is different. It's very different. Yes. Well, and then there's different seasons in life where there are things that you're limited in what you're able to give of yourself. Mm-hmm. And so um, while I was raising children um, and the meal train would come out to help someone, mm-hmm. you know, that I always signed up. I am not gifted at cooking. I am not good. Mm-hmm. I don't enjoy cooking, <laughs> but I knew that that was an, a way I could meet a need. And it was the only need I could meet during that season of my life. Like I couldn't take somebody to the doctor, right. Mm-hmm. Or, mm-hmm. you know, I, I had mm-hmm. kids at home or I couldn't, um, I couldn't do other things that other people were doing. Like I couldn't leave my house to go clean their house, but I do. There's just things that, you know, that, okay, I can do that right now. Like I can Mm -hmm. go shovel her driveway after the kids go to bed at night Mm -hmm. because she needs that, Mm -hmm. but I can't give her anything else. (laughs) You know, it's not, it's not a calling. It's not a gift. It was just like, I can actually just do that. And we all 
need to do those things. Like if we said no to everything that wasn't our calling, I mean, there's a lot of crappy jobs out there that just have to get done and someone has to step in and do them. And if there's nobody that feels a calling, then someone's just going to have to step in and do it. Girl, I am not called to clean the toilet. Okay. (laughs) But I'm cleaning my toilets. (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah. I think there's lots of menial tasks outside of our genius zone. I don't think that's what she's really talking about. I think she's just (laughs) saying like, don't make someone else's need if it's not your calling your life's work maybe you know yeah she said many other people will try to sign you up for their calling Mm, mm -hmm, (laughs) mm -hmm. yes yeah Yeah. that's true that's definitely true all right well how well do you set goals and does this come naturally and Mindy, like, I don't know. I feel like you might have a hard time setting goals. I feel like you've said that before. Not that you have a hard time meeting goals, but maybe yeah. that you have a hard time getting yes. what they are. Yes. I don't know. I have two major thoughts about that. First, I have been very, very firm about I do not fall into the setting um, New Year's goals because I knew I would fail. Mm-hmm. So I don't even set them. Mm-hmm. And then the other thought is sometimes I can't set a goal because goals sometimes feel so big. And so I have to say this, like a goal, I've had to come to the realization in my own life, it needs to be very small. Mm-hmm. Now it's still called a goal, but for some reason, setting goals sounds like it needs to be, I'm going to cl- climb Mount Everest. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. no, I can't set those goals in my life. I would never get there. So I actually am able to, um, set goals. And I realized I actually set goals every single day when I make a to-do list. Mm -hmm. I set goals every single week when I think, well, I'm not sure when I'm going to get that done, but I need to get that done. Mm -hmm. And so I needed to change my own mind about what setting goals looked like so that I felt more positive about it. And when I realized I was actually meeting goals and, and then exceeding my own expectations, I became very excited to, um, to set more goals because I knew I could reach them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not good at setting lofty goals and I don't know why I feel like goals have to be lofty, but I, I'm not good at like, I think, was that even big enough to be a goal? Like we need another word, Mindy, like you said, goals, not the right word. Like there needs to be an in between word maybe. Okay. So you feel the same way you hear goal and you Mm, think, yes. I mean, I feel like a goal has to be like mark off 10 things on my bucket list or hike Mount Everest or go around the world in 80 (laughs) days. Like something that people are going to be impressed with. Finishing the, the washing, drying the laundry, folding it and putting away. That's a goal. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Hard in my life. (laughs) Yeah. Any words of wisdom, Julie, for us? Yeah. (laughs) I know you've said you hate book of books about habits. Well, I hate books about goal setting. Oh, do you? (laughs) I just, yes, like something just, it just overwhelms me. I feel bad that I am not a goal setter. Like I don't Mm -hmm. sit down once a year and write out, Mm -hmm. you hear about the one-year goal, the five-year goal, the (laughs) 10-year goal. I have none of that. And yet it, it really perplexes me because like you said, Mindy, I'm glad you said this. I make a goal every day. I make a to-do, to-do list. I even make a weekly to-do list. And if I'm mm-hmm. planning a vacation, it's very goal oriented and I have it mm-hmm. down to the T. I work backwards and plan it out to achieve what mm-hmm. I want to achieve, you know, and but um, I, I guess it is that I don't set lofty goals. And, you know, I'm not thinking about what people are going to say at my funeral. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh. mm-hmm. And so I feel a little guilty in that. And um, but I like that she said setting goals is a learnable skill and that it's not about being brilliant, but people who have serious goals and use discipline to hammer away at their goals. That's, those are successful people. And, and, you know, I was just reading Psalm 90 this morning and I loved this because Moses said, teach us to number our days aright. And, you know, because our days are numbered and our life is short, we do need to be thinking about Mm -hmm. what we want to accomplish in our lifetime Mm -hmm. and that we want to for them to count as effective and productive. So that is biblical to to think about that. I just don't have it in my head how to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think for me is I don't even know what I want. If if I could, if somebody said, you need to be this in 10 mm-hmm. years, boy, I could lay out the plan. I really True. could. <laughs> yeah, if you give me a goal know. to reach, but yeah. I don't have an internal goal maybe that I'm 
can even think yeah, of. Like if somebody says, I want to go to London and have fun. Well, I've got you. I can, mm-hmm. I can do that. I can Thank figure you, that out. Yes. But, mm-hmm. but I don't know if you don't even know where you're going, it's mm-hmm. really hard to make a plan. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. My husband is genius at this and has been for years. We are so totally opposite. And he's still like, he'll have charts. He'll have, he'll have <laughs> graphs. He'll have, he spends time and he reaches his goals. The little ones, the big ones, the in-between ones. I, I have never met a person and I'm so proud of him. <laughs> but like, it's so funny that we are such opposite people, but I'm finally, now that I'm okay with my small goals that mm-hmm. I'm reaching. Mm-hmm. I'm finally okay. When he was like, Mindy, we really need to talk about the next five years. Like we're going to be empty nesters. And that, that, you know, would scare the socks off of me before I'm like, don't ask me. I don't want to think about that. You know, I don't want to think about mm. setting a goal for being empty nesters. And, mm-hmm. and he's all about it. He gets all excited. <laughs> well, maybe you can share his goals. Julie and I might like him and work towards him too. We just can't think of any goals. <laughs> Oh my gosh. John and I have never sat down and done that together either. It's just not like neither one of us are skilled at that. But yet you're both (laughs) successful people. So like, I know know he's got him in his head. He just doesn't write anything down. Yeah. Yeah. But like when she says that you have to, or that people that set goals are successful people, I take a little, you know, (laughs) I'm a little skeptical of that because I think that there are plenty of successful people that don't have the one year, five year, 10 year goals. Maybe they just have pervading principles. I think that's maybe what I yeah. have more is like principles mm-hmm. that I just see everything through or work towards. And so mm-hmm. maybe, I don't know. That, that well, again, and if you're accomplishing you know. those little goals every day, maybe that's yeah. what it takes. You know, I love, I think we should talk about two things she mentioned here. Okay. She mm-hmm. used a term called eat your frogs every day. Did y'all notice mm-hmm. that? Mm, I'd never heard of that. And she said a frog is just anything unpleasant but necessary. So she said, you just have to eat your frogs every day. And then she said, she talked about willpower points. Think about it like a bowl, your willpower points, like a bowl of nuts. Mm. And every time you do something hard, you take you take some nuts out of that bowl. So she said, do your high priority jobs or your difficult jobs early in the day while you still have willpower points left. Because they're going to get used up by the, you know, mid afternoon. So if mm-hmm. you still have hard stuff left to do, it's going to get even harder. Right. And, and I tend to save things for nighttime. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I tend to put maybe, things off. <laughs> okay. So maybe there's a genius zone part of your day. Cause I know my genius zone to get anything done is the morning. Yeah. Like if yeah. it does mm-hmm. not happen before noon, mm-hmm. it, the likelihood of it happening <laughs> yes. is way <laughs> <down>. <laughs> I no longer care. I'm no longer motivated. The later I get. Yeah. I get yeah. more motivated as the day goes on. <laughs> <laughs> well, the author, Julie Gordon, she encourages mastery in your genius zone. Julie, what does mastery look like or what might it look like? Well, she talks a lot about you know, it takes time to master a skill. And mm-hmm. she said, who wants to live a mediocre life? You know, like nobody is happy in a small, mediocre life. And um, when I talked to her about this, I, you know, I told her I had lots of interests. And she says, that's great. But that could also be a hindrance. Like in, until you narrow it down, you're going to be really scattered. Mm-hmm. And I kind of feel like that's how I am. Like I'm always trying something new and it's fun and it's great, but I'm really not, I've not found something that I'm willing to put in the long hours and the work to master it yet. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, I, I kind of still just want things to come easy, mm, mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. you know, like to be all fun. And I just haven't found something I want to commit to yet. And And I think, you know, once I find that, I might need to take some classes or study or talk to people in that field, you know, like kind of to get my focus and and learn more about it and Mm -hmm. put it into practice. I didn't identify my genius zone, but those principles are good that we might have some learning to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the things that she talks about in the book is um, narrowing our focus. And so do you have trouble saying no? Do you have a new commitment to say no to some activities so that you can say yes to the ones you want to focus on? I think that's one of the goals of this chapter was just kind of to get us to narrow our focus. So after she said that to you, Julie, after she said, well, you might be kind of scattered, did you feel 
some motivation then to start saying no to maybe some of your lesser interests? Not really. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't feel like I've found the thing yet. Okay. Okay. You know, and so, but I, I do understand the concept of, mm-hmm. you know, if you want to master something, you know, like a concert pianist mm-hmm. probably doesn't play racquetball or tennis because they might hurt their hands. You know, like mm. you have to say no to things to say mm-hmm. yes to others. So I totally get the concept. I just am not there yet. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like I'm still in the tryout stage. Sure, sure. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I've definitely, I'm, that's the point in my life where I'm at. Um, do I have trouble saying no? No. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and so um, I, I know that one of my things, a genius zone for me, I've mentioned it, just teaching workout classes. I do intentionally leave time for that in my schedule. It is a part of my day. It's a part of my planning process because I know this needs to be a part of my life, even if it's smaller sometimes and, you know, bigger at other times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking about narrowing your focus and I kind of feel like with my all my kids leaving this fall, everyone will either be married or in college. I kind of feel like as my kids have gotten older, I've narrowed my focus more and more. Like I almost used to do way more when they were smaller. Mm -hmm. Um, And then as you have teenagers and as Steve travels so much, I've narrowed my focus. And I feel like I've had such a narrow focus for a number of years now because I've been trying to focus on my teenagers, be available when they're available and like freeing up Steve to be able to travel for work so that I take care of everything here. Like I feel like I've been saying no and narrowing my focus so much that in the fall, when I maybe have more time to say yes to things, I think I'll probably be like Julie, like saying yes to everything. (laughs) And then maybe I will narrow, you know, again. But it's almost like you said, like, I need to be in the tryout stage. Like, I need to just be able to be free to try things. Mm -hmm. Because at this point in my life, I have not really been free for a number of years. Great point. So I do know how to say no. I think what I actually probably will need to learn to do in the fall is to say yes and then say no. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You are absolutely right about Mm -hmm. that. Well, this was definitely a worthwhile chapter. If you're reading the book along with us, I would love to hear from listeners if you did this exercise. You can email us at midlifematterspodcast at gmail.com. You can come and find us on Instagram at Midlife Matters Podcast. You can message us there. I would love to know, did anyone find their genius zone? Because I know we do have people reading along with us. And what is your genius zone? Yeah. And I will say this has brought up some neat conversations I mentioned earlier. My son with the Xbox. Well, that same son is really starting to think about the future Mm. right now also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he even asked, you know, how did, how did dad decide on the career that he's in? Because it was literally this practice activity that we've just talked about. Bryce and I did this for his career when we were newlyweds. Mm -hmm. And so this was his story, his career path and choosing the career that he's currently in was on purpose um, after being so unhappy um, in a job. It's neat because now with my son, he's starting to look at colleges. He's starting to think about what do I want to be when I grow up? You know, if Mm -hmm. I'm going to be working that many hours a week. And, And this chapter helped me use some of the terms that he could understand, you know, you Mm. talk about interest and skills and how does this, Mm -hmm. you know, will that meet a need and will somebody pay you to do it? Like, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah, (laughs) you know, so this was a, this brought up some really good conversations between me and my son as he really starts to look at, well, what am I interested in? Well, what am I good at? You know, and then will this meet a need and, and also adding, will it be paid? (laughs) Yeah, You know, I uh, have prayed this verse for each of my children and even in-law children. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's back in Psalm 90 and it's verse 17. It's the one I read today. And it, that last verse says, God, um, please establish the work of our hands. Yes. Establish Mm -hmm. the work of our hands. And I have just seriously prayed that for each of my kids because they didn't exactly know what they wanted to do. And I know that our work and our desire to be effective and productive comes from God. And if we don't have that, we're going to, 
we're going to be dissatisfied. Mm. And I've always just been amazed at my husband because he totally loves what he does. Mm. And that's why it's so been so hard for him to not work because I've never known anybody that loved their job, not necessarily their job. Like mm-hmm. right. there's difficulty in the workplace, yeah. you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. it's not all perfect, but what he does, right. he loves it. I just wish everybody could find that, you know, cause that's, I think that's kind of rare. Mm-hmm. I agree. Julie. Yeah. That is really what we do want for our kids and what mm-hmm. we want for ourselves in our second mm-hmm. end. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So let us know if you guys have come to anything as you've been reading this book this month. All right, but before we go, we want to do I'm a Fan. All right, Julie, what are you a fan of this week? All right, I'm a fan of another recipe, and it's called Hot Honey Chipotle Barbecue Chicken Nachos. Wow, and that sounds last really good. Week, I mentioned that I liked hot honey. And when I saw this recipe, I thought, ah, I have hot honey. So mm-hmm. <laughs> um, this is a, a sheet pan recipe and oh, I've made perfect. it twice and it is amazing. And I have simplified it. it you can make this mm-hmm. in five minutes. Um, mm. I use a rotisserie chicken mm-hmm. instead of cooking the chicken. And it calls for a homemade mango pico de gallo. Mm. But I just bought a really fresh mango salsa from the grocery store. Okay. And because that would be where all the work was, is chopping all that stuff up for the the pico. Mm. The only thing I would insist on chopping up fresh is the cilantro. Um, Mm. That really adds, if you like cilantro, that really adds a lot to it to put that on top. Mm. But it is amazing. It's an amazing meal. My boys devoured it. So Mm. (laughs) it sounds really good. Thank you for the hacks too, Julie. That's how I like recipes. I'm like, okay, you can save time by just buying them. I'm like, yes. I know. Yeah, actually, she even mentions that, like using, you put, um, you mix the spices up. Okay. You know, five or six little spices, put it in a bowl, and then you mix that in your shredded chicken. Mm. And I, the spice mixture is so good. Like I can see me using that for chicken tacos or in, in, any other right. recipe that might call for chicken. It's so good. Oh, Very perfect. Good. Well, we'll put a link to that in our show notes. All right, Mindy, what are you a fan of this week? I'm a huge fan of a new purse that I just bought for myself. Oh. Um, I I am a not necessarily a purse person. Mm-hmm. I will use one until it dies. And then I'm like, oh, I need a new purse. Mm-hmm. And so I actually went into the Kate Spade outlet not too long ago. And this one like totally called my name. Mm. I looked over and it said, Mindy, here I am. You Mm. have been looking for me. And I was like, yes, I actually put the purse on. It's a cross body purse. And I wore it around the store Mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, this is it. I am so getting this. All right. It's just a little Kate Spade. It's like Barbie pink. It is the brightest, (laughs) happiest pink color. And it just brought so much joy because we we talked about like fashion this year, the dopamine colors mm. or whatever, mm-hmm. those colors mm-hmm. that just bring you a lot of joy. This particular purse has brought me so much joy because it's so bright mm. and um, mm-hmm. it's a crossbody purse. Yes. So like I'm hands free and um, I just, I had some money that my husband had, you know, given me actually just to blow on my birthday. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, this is it. So oh, my little perfect. Kate Spade purse is just, it's brought me happiness. Yes. <laughs> that's awesome. And I do love it when you can find a purse that just meets all your needs. And it's yeah. not as easy to find it's a purse hard. that meets your needs as you think yeah. it might be. I'm so particular and picky. And so a lot of times I'm like, well, I'm not, I don't want to look because it's like finding the, the perfect pair of jeans for me. Mm-hmm. It's that hard. Mm-hmm. And this one, I'm telling you the the ease and being able to find it and everything was also with the amount, you know, with the color it brought yeah. me that much joy because it was so easy. So Right. Yeah. Meant to be. All right. Mm-hmm. Hopefully I can find a link for it because it okay. was at the outlet. outlet and I don't know how the outlet works with links. So sure. Okay. I'll send you a picture of me wearing it, it on- maybe. I don't know. Ye't yeah, on the website. Wearing it. 
Okay. Well, I am a fan of something I got for Christmas, or so yeah, something my mother in law got me for Christmas. It is a car organizer, which again, I think last week I had towels for I'm a fan, and I said that was kind of boring. And this week, car <laughs> organizers sound kind of boring, but they make your life a lot better. Like I have a minivan, and you know how it has that thing between the seats and it was forever yeah. filled with a bunch of junk that would slide forward and go on the floor if I'd break too hard or you know I'm have a million receipts there so mm-hmm. this is called the high road front and back seat car organizer caddy with movable dividers on Amazon and I just really found this to be very helpful it even it's a little big but that's because you can actually make it so that you're cutting it in half like with you can make it half its size or you can make it even bigger which makes it even more versatile has a place if you wanted to have like on your driver's side seat or a seat in the back you can even put a seat belt through it so the whole caddy doesn't go no way (laughs) yeah yeah so it's hard to describe but if you just need some car organization go to our show notes and you can see if what i am linking to would help you out i mean it really made the place between my two van seats a lot more functional. Wow. Super helpful, Marie, because I want my minivan, but I don't want to look like I have a minivan, if that mm, makes sense. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be a mess. With it. <laughs> a mess. Yeah. 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 No, I I agree. And Julie, you like car, car organizations because you said you have a bunch of little baskets in the back of your Mini Cooper that help you. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, it's amazing how just a little bit of organization can improve your life. Yes. So you need a space, though, in between your seats. You, you couldn't uh, have well, a console? Well, actually, the, like pictures, a... the pictures they show could even just be on one of your seats, you know, because you can oh, put okay. the seatbelt through it, too. And um, yeah, no, you don't need to. It just so happens that it fit really well on my console between the minivans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right, listeners, we hope that you have enjoyed our musings about finding the genius zone. And I look forward to finding out from you, Julie and Mindy, how you keep (laughs) progressing on this episode, because we do want to find that place where we lose track of time and we love what we're doing and we're going to get there. Yeah, Yeah, we need to hear hear back in a year. Uh huh. <laughs> we do. We need to <laughs> check in. I yeah. I felt that way. Yeah, with other chapters too. Like, how are you doing on that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, Julie, Mindy, we'll talk to you next week. All right. Bye. Okay, bye. bye. We're so happy you joined us today. You can find the show notes for this episode at midlifematterspodcast dot com. Also, please tell a friend about the show and help them hit the free subscribe button on their favorite podcast app. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Midlife Matters Podcast. That's where we post pictures and stories about all the things we talk about in each episode. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.